Welcome back to The Hill Update. My name is Dean Allison and I'm your host. It has been a difficult year for all Canadians and frankly, for all people all across the world. The global pandemic has affected virtually all aspects of life. All levels of government here in Canada had to respond and had to respond quickly to save lives. They put in place measures to help soften the blows of this horrible virus. So how did Canada fare in this response? Specifically, how well did our federal government do? Before anything, let's admit that no one thought a pandemic would be something they would have to live through. Virtually no one thought it was a realistic possibility in this day and age. So we can't expect our federal government to not make mistakes when dealing with a totally new situation. To their credit, they rolled out programs that helped many Canadians over the last year. But where did they go wrong? Many would say delays, delays in procuring vaccines being one of the most critical missteps. In fact, our American friends have noticed our wobbly vaccination program and have started reporting on it. They are comparing their vaccination rate of 30% to that of Canada's 12%. Those are the stats so far for getting at least one vaccine dose. So the US is at 30% and Canada's at 12%. That's a huge difference. Clearly, the federal government is having issues with delays in getting vaccines to Canada. This issue has been in the news since the end of last year. How many times in the last four months have we heard that Ottawa can't get enough vaccines and is unable to get them quickly, putting our vaccination rate behind that of many other countries? This is concerning, considering that some zoo animals in Oakland Zoo might actually have their access to the vaccine before many Canadians. Unfortunately, this is not a joke. In addition to recent reports assessing government's pandemic response, the Auditor General had a lot to say about Ottawa's missteps in handling the pandemic. For example, the Auditor General reports that Canada's public health agency was unprepared for the pandemic and underestimated the danger the virus posed. The report also found failures in early warning, surveillance, risk assessments, data sharing with the provinces, and follow up on Canadian travellers who were ordered into quarantine. When the government called over a million Canadians home last year, they had not implemented the necessary tools to monitor returning travellers, and they didn't have the ability to enforce quarantine. The government was slow to see temperature scanners or rapid tests as useful screening aids for international travellers. On the issue of closing the border, Ottawa was again slow to react. In fact, the government only took action after the rest of the world did. The government even accused its critics of racism, critics who were calling for immediate border closures given the gravity of the virus in Asia, Europe, and the Middle East. The Auditor General's report also says that Canada's public health agency did not know whether two-thirds of the incoming travellers followed quarantine orders. Domestically, Canada was also slow to change course on recommendations for mask wearing for health and long-term care workers on the front lines and for the public. In short, Ottawa was unprepared and slow to react. The Toronto Star had this to say, Canada didn't act nimbly or swiftly, and it should stop pretending as though it did. The author goes on to say that the response has been sluggish and slow, often trailing other countries' moves. The Trudeau government made assumptions it never should have. And lastly, the article's assessment of this response is this. The picture that really emerges is that Canada failed on pre-pandemic preparation, stumbled in its mid-pandemic responses, and continued to lack a clear end of pandemic game plan. Those are strong statements from a publication that is usually much friendlier to the federal government, indicating that even within its support base, the government is facing serious criticism for how it handled the pandemic. Noticing these mistakes, Conservative leader Aaron O'Toole says that if he is elected Prime Minister, he will initiate a public inquiry to examine every aspect of the government's pandemic response. O'Toole says that the inquiry will ensure that all lessons learned from the crisis are publicly aired and learnings could be immediately adopted. Joining me on the show this week is Brian Giesbrecht, former retired Manitoba Provincial Court Judge and a senior fellow with the Frontier Center for Public Policy and a frequent commentator on public policy issues. When we come back, we are going to discuss an article Brian co-authored with George Koch on holding back the pandemic tide and other government delusions. And we'll get right into how the government fared when they started back last January with this pandemic as we saw it sent to our shores. 
We'll see you when we come back for break. Welcome back. Joining me on the show this week is Brian Giesbrecht, who wrote an interesting article back in February. It was, and the title of the article was called Holding Back the Pandemic Tide and Other Government Delusions. Brian, talk to me about that and what you were getting at when we talked about uh, our response as a country uh, over the last year to the pandemic. Well, uh, and I and I uh, start by saying it's easy to be an armchair qu quarterback. You guys in Ottawa and the, and the, and the leaders in, in the provinces actually uh, are saddled with this huge burden of trying to respond to uh, to something brand new. But but I I think that um, what we know now at least is that some some decisions were better than others and. Uh, um, what I talk about in that essay, what George and I talk about in that essay, is, is a, um, I think, a trap that the leaders uh, sort of made for themselves. And uh, that uh, uh, started um, uh, uh, last um, spring uh, when the uh, uh, numbers started to go down. And um, everybody is patting themselves on the back for doing such a wonderful job. Uh, and, and I go through that in the essay with the comments about uh, uh, flattening the curve and slap, slapping down the curve and, and, and that sort of thing. Well, uh, the fact is that the numbers were falling everywhere. The, the numbers were falling in the lockdown countries. The, the, uh, uh, the numbers were falling in, in, in the countries that... Uh, did not uh, do the lockdown. And uh, what was happening was mainly, uh, uh, I believe, uh, uh, just a natural occurrence. And I think it was fairly, uh, I think most of the scientists expected uh, in the flu season in the fall and winter, uh, the, the, uh, um, the virus to come back. And of course it did, it came back with a vengeance. But when the people took credit for um, the numbers going down, the trap was was sprung because they then were responsible for the numbers going up, and I think if right at the beginning there had been a little more humility in in acknowledging that this is a virus and and uh, the smartest politician or even the smartest <laughs> and the scientist in the world has no control over uh, over a virus. We, the, we governments are are limited in what they can do. They cannot make a virus disappear. They cannot. Uh, make it just go away and and i i uh, started doing a little inquiry into the thinking of some of the uh, states and countries that seem to have done a little better than others right early on and right at the beginning and and what i found was kind of interesting because the uh, for instance the the uh, the thinking here well what did our prime minister say to us right at the beginning he said i'm going to keep you safe i'm going to keep canadians safe well that's uh that's a that's a nice sounding thing, but that's actually an incredible claim because he can't. Uh, no leader had the ability to just stop this virus virus in its tracks. Uh, this is a deadly virus for extremely lethal, particularly for the uh, uh, nursing home population as well as for the obese. And politicians should should be humble about what they can do. Well, I I looked at. And, and the discussions that took place in Sweden, which which did things a, a different way. And the first thing the Swedes said is, well, we have no idea what this virus is going to do. We don't know how bad this is going to get. But the last thing we want to do is destroy our economy because we can't do that. Then our hospital system will collapse, etc. So we have to, whatever we do, we have to be in this for the long haul and we have to adopt a strategy that's going to be uh, sustainable. Now, as it turns out, uh, I think the Swedes uh, admit that uh, as far as the nursing home populations go, they made the same mistakes we did. In other words, they didn't take it nearly serious enough and they, and they, um, uh, and, and they made exactly the same mistakes where they, where they allowed uh, uh, untested uh, uh, people to be going in and out of the institutions. And as, as a consequence, they had a number of deaths. So their death toll is probably about average for, for Europe. But they did do some things 
right. And they, they got some of the things really right. For instance, they didn't believe that schools had to be closed. They said, well, if it got really bad, they would do that. But it didn't look like um, I mean, children were being badly affected. And they made the right decision. They kept their schools open. So other countries uh, that had uh, closed schools, Norway, Austria, etc., saw what the Swedes were Brian, doing. They opened their I, schools I need to hold up. that. I need to hold that thought. When we come back for break, let's discuss how, how they handled it a little bit differently at the beginning sure. of most others. Joining me on the Hill Update today, I'm Brian uh, Giesbrecht, who's a former a retired Manitoba judge. And we were just talking a little bit about how different provinces, different countries handle things a little bit differently at the beginning, which probably set the tone for how countries and provinces handle it through the whole uh, through the whole pandemic. So let's go back. You're talking a bit about Sweden and what they had done sort of to get started in the pandemic and how that sort of set the course for how they would handle it for the rest of the rest of the year. Yeah, and, and so they did, they, they kept schools open, which was a model for the rest of the Europe, which most of the countries there reopened fairly fairly soon in, in, in April and really had no problem with the school reopening. So that's one of the, the thing, one of the decisions that was made, uh, uh, that was the right decision. Now, they also did things differently than we did in that they did not force businesses to close. And I think uh, what what uh, the evidence shows is that was the right decision. It, there was going to be uh, unemployment no matter how things were done, because when infections were very heavy, for instance, you wouldn't be in a, in a, in a Swedish restaurant or a French restaurant, you're not going to find that many, many people, particularly the older people, uh, uh, stayed away, which was natural. People take care of their, their own health. They do their own risk assessments. But they, they showed that it was not necessary to actually force businesses to close. And I think they've been proven right in that. And other uh, parts of the, the world have, have, have done the same thing. And some of the American states, for instance, Florida, um, uh, Arkansas, Idaho, etc., have done the same things, South Dakota, North Dakota. They've kept their businesses open. So I think they've 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 shown that um, the idea the, the 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 lockdown idea which was a which was a huge experiment the basic idea is faulty the the idea of closing businesses and shutting schools is not the answer I would suggest that the answer is to immediately focus on the vulnerable. Uh, that means getting directly, immediately to nursing homes and putting your your resources into uh, into nursing homes, so Brian, shoring up hospital systems, etc. So, Brian, yeah. talk to me about the response across this country in terms of, you know, every province is, you know, a lot did lockdown, some didn't. So, any any comments on how you think we did across the, uh, you know, because I, I know BC didn't lock down as much and, you know, we have a bubble in the East Coast. So, any, could you give us a little bit of comparison to what, what happened here in Canada? Well, my, my uh, view is that some of the, the premiers initially, at least, were, were very common sense. They were saying things like, um, uh, we have to learn to live with this virus and we have to do what we can, but we've got to keep the economy strong. Uh, and individuals should should assess their own, um, uh, um, uh, you know, health risks, etc. So initially, many of the provinces were adopting, I think, a very common sense approach, and I believe that's what they should have should have should have stuck with. But that's not the way it's happened because every one of the premiers has now um, uh, buckled down to pressure. The very strong pressure to simply lock down is the answer to everything. And I do blame the prime minister in large part for that because he put a lot of pressure on the um, uh, on the premiers to either accept uh, government restrictions uh, or else basically he wasn't going to he wasn't going to send the money. And our federal government is the uh, is the level of government with the money. So I, the I, I, for sure. 
Sorry, but I, but I, I, I do think he set the tone because he, he was fully invested in this in the lockdown idea. And I think that was very unfortunate because I believe that some of the premiers would have kept with their uh, more common sense approach uh, if it had not been for that uh, financial pressure and the climate of fear uh, that has been that has been created uh, in this country. And not it's not a realistic uh, attitude. Some people are at, at at terrible risk of death, but most people, most healthy people, uh, are are not uh, at, at at risk of death if they get the disease. But we have parents who are afraid to send their kids to school because they think the school the children will die at school. It's quite bizarre uh, how this uh, the, the, the the fear has morphed in this country. So I I don't know who to blame for that. I think it's a combination. Of all of us are to blame, I, I suppose. But the uh, the, the leaders, the, the the mainstream media, Brian, uh, did I, not. I got to cut you off there. But what, when we come back, let's talk yeah. about maybe what some are some potential solutions as we move forward. Sure. Welcome back to the Hill Update. So, Brian, we were talking before the break uh, about how provinces did things a little bit differently in the beginning versus where they were at the uh, at the end or towards the end of the year. You were starting to talk about other examples around the world, uh, some in the states, and, and obviously you referred to Sweden. As now we go into sort of a third, you know, slash fourth lockdown in some places. Talk to us about what you know we should be looking at trying to do. I mean, you've talked a lot about trying to balance the economy. With health, and I think these are all important things. Likewise, you've also talked about the health of our seniors and long-term care homes. So, just talk to me about your thoughts as we're right now in the, in, you know, currently in another lockdown here in Ontario. Various stages of other things across the country. What are some suggestions in terms of how we could uh, work ourselves out of this and try and take a more balanced approach? Well, I mean, thank goodness we have the uh, uh, the vaccines. These vaccines. Uh, uh, by all accounts, I know there are some uh, uh, stories about uh, blood clots, etc. But we have to keep that in context because they, they are over, overwhelmingly wonderful. This is this is wonderful technology. We should obviously be getting everybody uh, vaccinated as quickly as possible, uh, starting with the most vulnerable, and that only makes makes sense. And as uh, people are the vulnerable are vaccinated, the death rate is going to go down. So I suggest that we should not be uh, fixating on uh, in infection numbers. We're going to be, I think the scientists say, we're going to be getting mutations. I know they're called variants. It makes it sound a little scarier. But these are mutations uh, for you know probably many years to come. And we're going to have to learn to live with this. But if we have the uh, especially the vulnerable uh, vaccinated, we shouldn't be obsessing about infection numbers. We should be concentrating on on uh, getting businesses back um, uh, up and running successfully, getting the economy going, and for heaven's sakes, not shutting down schools. I noticed that they weren't doing that again in Ontario, and that seems to be uh, just a very bad policy because we're only beginning to understand how how much uh, we have, uh, how much damage we have been doing to our children by closing schools. It's just been absolutely wrong. So I would say that, that uh, uh, yes, uh, um, the um, um, vaccine rollout is the number one uh, issue and we should be doing everything we can. I, I don't understand how our country did so poorly on vaccine uh, procurement. Uh, the United States and, and uh, uh, the, uh, the United Kingdom are far ahead of us, and even nations that have uh, that aren't nearly as wealthy are way further along than we are. But regardless, we should now be getting the vaccines and getting them to everybody's uh, everybody that wants them. Some people, you know, some people will not, but everybody that wants them, so that we can get on with normal life. But above all, we shouldn't be so fearful because there is a climate of fear in this in this country and it doesn't have to be that way uh if you are in a 
in, in I mentioned Sweden or, or Norway, or if you're in Florida, or if you're in Arkansas, people are not living with this, this uh, just this huge cloud of fear. This is a bad virus, This and, and the variants are going to be bad and that sort of thing. But I mean, it looks like um, uh, we are going to have these, uh, these mutations uh, uh, for a long time. We've just got to find a better way of, uh, of, of moving forward and getting rid of some of this fear. Brian, 30 seconds left. Any final thoughts? Well, and the final thought is I really regret all of the restrictions that the uh, leaders have put in place. I think letting people make their own health decisions and risk assessments was a much better way of doing it. And I just uh, encourage uh, bipartisan um, um, by party studies of all of this when we're when we're all done so that we can do things better the next time around. Melissa Bryan, thank you very much uh, for joining us on the show today. And uh, I look forward to any other future articles that you may be writing. Have a great one. Okay, thanks very much, Dean. Thanks thank for having me. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, we heard today that uh, we should be looking at a balanced approach when we look at pandemics, we getting kids back in school, trying to keep some businesses open, and then we always have to watch the fear factor. Obviously, this pandemic has been tough on a lot of people, but we need to try and work hard to try and get back to some sense of normal. Thank you for joining me on the Hill Update this week.